Hey guys, it's Matt. Uh, the only format that fits this is going to be the old fashioned radio show. I'm so exhausted from shoveling. I'm in Pennsylvania, outside Philadelphia, clearing gutters, roof raking, raking, um, making sure the ice doesn't collect in my gutters. Every time we get a snow, it's like two hours. I'm so tired. I'm like high. I, 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 it's very early here still on a Thursday. I haven't been drinking. I'm on no substances. I'm literally so giddy. I'm just exhausted, and it's it's affecting my brain. So there's no other format. This is appropriate for this than, a, than an old-fashioned radio show. This isn't for 1.25ers. See what truth can be sucked out of Matt's presentation today. Then we'll jump over to UAP, suck something out of there. Or just the whole whole life is just trying to collect information and never actually arrive anywhere on your own for yourself. For yourself, this is more of um, let's just examine human nature for a bit. Um, although let's get the most important news story out of the way. A radio show does have a little segment of news typically, and there's nothing more important than the fact that the UAE. <laughs> I told you I'm I'm like so tired. I'm high. The UAE, <laughs> the United Arab Emirates, has successfully their probe <laughs> successfully flying around Mars. Now, I don't know if this thing intends to land, to make contact with Matt Damon. I don't know if Matt Damon has tried to make contact with it. Does he, I don't know, what do they speak in UAE? Do they speak, I don't, I guess it's Arabic. I don't, a little bit of Farsi. I don't know. I guess that's, that's, that's Iran. Uh, sorry about that. If I, if, um, if I offended anybody. Have you seen the UAE mission control or their equivalency of Houston? Have you seen it? Any videos or images of it? I don't know really what to say, but this is the best way to put it. If I went down to the local middle school here and I said, take me to a random seventh grade classroom, and I gave those seventh graders a budget, say a budget of $3,000, they would be able to, just by going out to Best Buy, buying some laptops, putting any old mumbo jumbo, maybe the matrix code on some of the screens, they could make it look more legitimate and I could set it up where you would be more apt to believe that the seventh grade classroom in Mrs. Libby's seventh graders are taking a probe called Hope around Mars than the UAE is doing it. I mean, take a look at the video, guys. I, I don't have it in the link. It's the biggest story in the world right now. It's the biggest story in the world. I'm sure all the Arab uh, nations uh, are, are, are rejoicing as to their fake triumph. I'm going to talk a bit, though, about human nature and what modern society, or especially a socialist-type environment like a France or a Canada, devolves or just kills the human spirit, devolves a human being down into something that's even farther away from a real human than we recognize or don't recognize in most Americans. I mean, it's just far worse if you go into Sweden or the just the hardcore socialist states of the EU. Let me get to the, the point by starting with a, a story. And uh, this happens all the time. And this story about human nature and the devolution of it relates uh, will relate to stories of me going into Montreal, Canada, and a similar type of behavior. I experienced there, and I'm not. I'm not classifying all Canadians or what. I'm just. You can see that there is a culture in certain places, and the society, and the socialist nature of the society, as more and more government is introduced, and it's happening. Right, it's already happened in the United States. We keep saying happening. It's already here. It's just they've had it a lot longer than quote we've had it. But here's the point. The point is, I'm out there shoveling out my mailbox. You know, so the guy can deliver the mail. And here comes, well, let me just back up a second. My road is two parts. The one part of the road, about a mile or two long, is they call it a state road. And I think because there's access to the Pennsylvania Turnpike and plows and police or rescue workers would need to use that road to get on the Pennsylvania Turnpike in an emergency. I'll talk about the, the corruption of the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission in a little bit if I remember. But my side of the road is the responsibility of the township. Now, this township has no services compared to all the other townships around th this area. You have a Upper Marion Township in Montgomery County with the King of Prussia Mall, 
one of the they, – they, they, they like to go up against the Mall of Americas in Minnesota. They say King of Prussia has more shopping, even though Mall of Americas is bigger. It's the biggest mall. That's their claim to fame. How pathetic is that? A claim to fame is the biggest mall. But – they have all this police, firefighters. Most townships have you know, these big fire companies. Here where I am, there's nothing. There's no services in this township. We have to contract out with some local fire company about a mile away. But the point is the plows, the monster plows that plow the Pennsylvania Turnpike, they plow the other side of my road because it's classified as a state road, I guess, on their way to get to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. But they come right down my road – to get to the other side, that's the state road. Since this side isn't a state road, does anybody understand where I'm going with this? They don't have the plow down. <laughs> They're just driving across four or five inches of snow. And it's like all they have to do is put the plow down. It would say, Sometimes we have to wait 10, 12 hours to get plowed out by that old clunker that services this township. So they're driving. See, I, I don't, who knows what they would say? You know, again, putting the plow down, these are monsters, these things, monsters. And they plow the other side of, 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 the, of the same road because that's classified as a state road. So why not just drop the plow and help us out? Can't do it. And you get into things like not my job, liability reasons. I mean, just all the red tape. The whole society is set up so there's no human beings that can make real human decisions. If there was anybody was a, no, the human decision was removed. You can't if it's not your. And I'm going to tell you about what happened to me, or several things happened to me in in Montreal, Canada, uh, especially one particular thing at the airport. Everybody's inside this little box of not my job. Uh, this is the, uh, your side. They they would stop literally, and I'd I'd have them roll the window down if if, if I ever did talk to them. They just roll right by, and they would say, "No, we are under strict orders not to plow this side um, because it's not the state road." And I would say back to them, "Well, I know it's not the state road. Just drop the plow. How hard is that? As you drive th through the six or seven inches, just drop the plow. You're gonna. It doesn't. It, these things are monsters. It the, it would not." It wouldn't cause them any extra work. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't even add one minute onto their journey. Maybe they'd have to slow down a tiny bit. But they're monsters. Just drop the plow. See, then I'd have to wait 10 hours or 12 hours to be plowed out. And they would explain to me about the legality of – you know where I'm going. There's no human decision – that humanity – that whatever whatever exists in people where people just make the common sense decision is being destroyed across the board. Of course, this is one of millions of examples. You just wonder, was there ever a time, maybe back in the 80s or early 90s, when two guys were riding in these monster 10-ton plows and they were driving through my road, just driving through the eight inches of snow, and the one guy in the passenger sa said, uh, hey, Don, you know, why don't you just... Let's just drop the plow. Why don't we just plow it as we drive through? Why don't you just drop the plow? And the senior uh, supervisor said, uh, no, Jack, we can't do that. That's not our job. There's liability. You want to protect your pension, don't you, son? And, and see, it was never brought up again. It was never brought up again. Now, in any socialist country, like or that's known to be socialist, this is socialism here in, in the U.S. just masquerading as as a as a, a freedom loving nation, it's just a masquerade here. But in any country that actually calls itself socialist, Canada, um, France, um, Belgium, you know, a lot of the EU, um, I, I figured it out. I figured out a big part of figuring out the culture of these places. Between 2004 and 2007, I worked for a Canadian company, and I have to fly up there. I don't know. Every two or three, or four months or so, I have to go up there maybe four or five times a year in some cases. And I could just never figure it out. Like what, you know, it's got the same, it's like that scene in Pulp Fiction. It's got the same things that we have, but it's just different. Like what's different about it? Like, okay, you know, they have Rogers cellular and we have Verizon or what it just, but, and, but it just, what's, there's something I can't put my finger on. And I finally figured out a big piece of it. And I went, I got it. Now this doesn't explain everything, but the, the entire culture is bred with this slogan. It never comes out, but it's in everything they do. Do your job and nothing more. Do your job and nothing more. If it is not inside the defined box of your job description, never step outside of your defined box. And I bet that from the Canadian culture or French culture, that extends into many other things other than just employment. Okay, they, it's do this as I've been told, and never ever 
stray into what could be the common sense area or the human area, which many parts of, there's still parts of the U S that exist where people doing the human thing or the common sense thing or what the situation in front of them calls for. There's still a lot of places in the United States or pockets where this has still been carried forth. The lessons learned from their father or mother or grandparents. Usually it's the grandparents. Much of this has been snuffed out in father or mother, especially if you're under age 35. But it's no more pronounced than in these socialist countries. So let's just let me give you the example now, and then we'll keep talking about it. Um, went to the airport in Montreal early. And I used to do this all the time, flying between Phoenix and LA. I would go early and be like, hey, put me on an earlier flight. I want to get out of here. And I don't know exactly how I put it. Maybe the person that was getting my ticket ready, this is, guys, this is uh, when you actually had to deal with a human being. I haven't flown for so long. I don't even know what it's like now. But maybe she was talking to someone else. And I'm sure I made it clear, like, if there's any any earlier flights, you know, I, I'll, I'm ready to move quickly and to, to get on the earlier flights. But I don't know. It was something about where she would have to – Maybe she had already started printing the ticket or she'd have to do something special or extra. Like what else? There was no line behind me. Okay, no line at all. She would have just had to have done something outside these parameters, this little box. And she basically was like, I don't know exactly how. She might not have said there were no other flights or lied to me. But I got the impression, the point is, I would have absolutely asked and I know I asked for an earlier flight. I used to do it all the time. And she basically didn't want to check other screens or do – she just didn't want to do one inch other than what her job called for. Basically said, no, sir, you're confirmed on the 5 o'clock and whatever. Now, I know I must have asked because I was fuming later. It's been how many – how long is this? was this 15 years ago? I don't remember every detail. But – so I get the ticket. And for some reason in Montreal, some of the gates to go back to the U.S., you're talking like – it's literally like a half mile. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. You just walk and walk and walk. I don't know what it's like now. This is, say, 2004, 2005 or so. Um, and I look at the board, and I don't know. Say it's uh, 5 o'clock. This is um, 5.20 flight to Philadelphia. And I'm on, I don't know, maybe I'm on like a 6.45 or 7.30. I'm like, what? There's the, the earlier flight right there. And, and there was, they're never, when, when I used to do this, they were never completely booked. So I start running. And I know how long the gates are in Montreal. I start running with two big bags and a suit on. And I know it's going to be – but I just want to get out of there. I want to get back. I don't know if it had to do with beating a – I don't know the timing of this. Maybe there's a reason I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. Sometimes I want to get out of there, like beat the rush hour in the Shirk Hill Expressway, Route 76 out of Philadelphia. Whatever it is, I'm running running. And I'm thinking, and I remember thinking that woman, you know, she, all she had to do was do a little few extra things to try to find me the earlier flight. And I get down there and they had, they're, they're like, literally, I mean, it was, it was, um, there was no time to spare and they're like closing the doors as I come up to the gate agents. And I'm like, hey, is that flight full? And, and, and for some reason I knew it wasn't full or somebody said it wasn't full. I don't remember the details. This is 15 years ago. But they like closed the door instead of just – instead of see, do your job and nothing more. They, they could have made a quick phone call, all right? Um, hold on. We're going to just re redo this guy's ticket. Just give me one more minute on the closing the doors or anything. Just They literally closing the doors in my face. And I'm like, put me on this flight. You know, do your job and nothing. They would, they, they never would, nobody would even think to say, we got one more here. Just give me a minute. They're not operating to the second or anything like that. There was no weather issue. There was no backup. You know, it's like nobody did any little bit of extra. If one person would have said one thing or would have gone one extra step, I would have been on that flight. And as I sat there, you know, because I was obviously so early for my flight, I sat there for like an hour and 40 in that chair because flights from Montreal to Philly are pretty frequent during the day, maybe two hours. And I thought I got it. If just I dealt with, say, three people along the line here, if one person would have gone one little inch out of their way and I said, I got it. The whole culture here is designed around do your job and nothing more. And, I'm, and I was trying to apply that to a lot of other things like, um, you know, like, can I get an extra roll, miss? Um, no, one roll with dinner. Like they're just, you know, they're, it's just a roll. Now, 
I'm just making that up, but it's like it's pervasive when an entire culture has assigned not just employment, but what you're supposed to do is in a box. How you're supposed to act is in a box. You're never, you know, no hitchhiker can ever be picked up. The state will take care of that. No homeless can ever be fed. The state will take care of it. It destroys the common sense, which is like the bridge to a real human being making decisions based on the situation at hand that's in front of them to help another human being. It's just, it destroys all that. And of course, you know where I'm going to go. It's not just something that evolved on its own. It's all by design. And when you speak to these Canadians, again, I can only, I've been back and forth to Canada a lot of times, mostly Montreal. I can only speak to that, but I'm sure a lot of the EU is similar. They will defend the elements of their socialism with conviction. And it almost came off to me, almost like a mind control where I thought this person I'm talking to, or we're kind of debating with, they're trying to convince themselves they're using this as an opportunity to convince themselves as much as it is to convince me. Let me give you an example. Um, I would debate with this person that worked uh, where I worked up there. His name was Paul. And, we, you know, socialism versus say this is, you know, when obviously I didn't know in 2005 uh, the things I know now about what's really behind the curtain here. Uh, but it certainly at the time appeared that there was appeared there was much more freedom and and choice and liberty. It certainly appeared that way, and and it, I guess in practice in 2005 it still was much better than uh, a Montreal or a Paris, France. But he would he would say in, in the U.S. Who's your trash service? And I'd be like, oh, it's uh, you know waste management or whatever. And he would be like, "Well, you have choices, right? You have to, you can, you can, you can pick from two or three or four providers." I'm like, "Yeah, there's like four providers I could pick from in my area." He's like, "Well, that's horrible." He literally was making this. He's like, "We have it provided by the state. I don't have to try to have a company that try to increase rates on me." And they do that all the time. The trash companies, the rate will go up, and until you make a phone call every two years, I'm like, "I'm going to leave you." It's like Comcast versus Verizon. You have to threaten to leave them, then they'll reduce your rate. It's like I don't have to deal with that. The state just picks the trash up. I don't have to negotiate or switch carriers and worry about all that. Like you're, you're saying lack of choice. You're saying that's a big plus. He was completely convinced of it. I said, well, what happens? They're all union, right? Well, of course. They're, you know, of course, they're state. Well, what happens when they go on strike, which they, I'm sure they do up here every five years? The trash just piles up for months while they try to increase their, their benefits package. I mean that that can't happen to my trash. I mean, so we just go back and forth. Obviously, guys, and, uh, there's no situation, no situation where a choice is going to be worse than having it provided by a government. Are you kidding me? There could be certain advantages from what he's saying, but, but ultimately when you do the, the comparison on the spreadsheet, a one option provided by government is never going to be as good as a choice, even if that choice comes from corporations. But one of the main points here is I just got the sense that it wasn't like he, he believed it, but he didn't believe it. I was like, he's trying to convince himself as well. Now, if you put him on a lie detector test, he would be like, oh, you know, he'd pass. He, he believes in all the social conviction of, of what the city of Montreal provides. But, you know, we get a sixth sense. I absolutely sensed that part of his presentation was to convince himself. And you know how the, the mind works, the ego convincing other – we have different aspects of us. Even even the mind is even different aspects, and I'm not even talking about spiritual self. Um, of course, the – the ego and the certain parts of the socialist citizen that was bred by the good socialist city of Montreal the, was, was stepping forward and actually trying to convince the other parts of him that this is the best way. Everybody else, everybody else that might dissent in my own mind, quiet down, simmer down now, simmer down now. The socialism is the best. And, he, and I'm going to use this debate with Matt to, to prove it, not just to Matt, but to all the other dissenting viewpoints in my own mind. Wait, this just in. My producer's handing me a note. This just in. Breaking news. The Hope Probe from the United Arab Emirates <laughs> that's, that's now around Mars, it has found Matt Damon's camp. It is, it is 
hovering over Matt Damon's camp as we speak, and it is delivering him the necessary potato and spud growing supplies that he so desperately needs to survive on Mars. Pot- any, it, it's, it's big packets from Spuds or Us. There's hose, rakes, not hose, hose, hose and rakes. Where was your mind? Get your head out of the gutter. Hose, rakes, Real fertilizer, so he doesn't have to use his natural fertilizer. By the way, guys, when when you're watching that movie and he's using his own stuff as fertilizer, I don't want to get too graphic. You know, um, did you ever think there's like a you know he's 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 trying to you know ration his food so he barely can eat anything. Where is he? Why is he producing? And all that waste, and he's producing industrial amounts of fertilizer so he can grow entire crops of potatoes. Did anybody notice that after the accident that blew out all his spuds, that the whole thing, part of his uh, little apartment there blew up, he duct taped his helmet? Did anybody notice they duct taped his helmet? Well, they duct taped the back of the rover. <laughs> they duct taped the fender back on in uh, on Apollo. Was it Apollo 14 or 15? The fender was coming off. He duct taped it right back on. Like it's the same mission that made the hammering noises. But Matt Damon was so adept at survival that not only could he survive anyway, half of his apartment got blown up and his entire food supply got blown out. And he still survived somehow. It's incredible. It really is an incredible movie. I know it's a movie, but it's very moving. It's very emotional. And it's what movie making should be. And it's what acting's all about. When you see not the role he's playing, Mark Watney, I think was his name. When you see Matt Damon and nothing but Matt Damon, and you don't see any of the character, now that's... It's giving me chills thinking about it. That's what I call acting. This is the old radio show, so let's just do this for a few minutes. The people that just come here for nothing but their hardcore dark reality fix, they're going to get a little, start to shake like somebody that hasn't had heroin for a few days. Like, give it to me, man. Don't don't go away from the dark reality very long, man. I don't know what I'll do. I mean, okay, okay, I'll come back to the dark reality. Who are you talking to here? I, you know, I spend seven days a week looking at the dark reality. But the, it is fascinating to me that when you see the character and you no longer see the actor or actress, I'm still going to say actor, actress. I don't care. Uh, they're going to ban me for that? Maybe. But Tom Cruise... All right, I know a lot of you would be like, Matt, I see Tom Cruise. But I'm telling you, he's a good actor. He really is. A lot of times you see – the ca- most times you see the character. You don't see just Tom Cruise. Matt Damon, of course, you know is the worst. You see nothing but Matt Damon. Jason Bourne, no. I see Matt Damon running around putting a pencil in a guy's eye. Tom Hanks, of course he's a creep. I don't like him. Chorus, yeah. I ain't gonna break bread with him, invite him to my Thanksgiving dinner to break bread with that that creep. I wouldn't I wouldn't let him in if his car broke down outside my house, it was snowing outside, Tom Hanks. But he you don't see Tom Hanks. You really see the character. You see the character. And we should do that uh with other actors and see what what comes up. Like um Clint Eastwood. You know? I think I don't you don't you, you kinda always know it's Clint, of course, but but you do you do he does do a good job with the with the character. I said before Cuba Gooding Jr. in radio. I know it's if you're not used to it's weird, like it's really kind of like the first fifteen minutes of him as radio and you're trying but once you settle into that first fifteen minutes, he becomes radio. You don't see Cuba Gooding Jr. It is amazing, amazing job. So if you mention Matt Damon, another terrible one has to pop into your mind because they're joined at the hip together. Of course, Ben Affleck. It's another guy. You don't you don't really ever see the character. You just see Ben Affleck. He was Batman in Justice League. It's just it's just Ben Affleck in a Batman costume. You don't you don't see Batman where. Um, of course, oh my gosh, the the uh, Dark Knight. I guess Heath Ledger as the Joker and Joaquin. Phoenix as the Joker. Those two Joker roles are you don't you don't see the actor. You see the character. I mean that's that's hard. It's an embarrassment to even have Ben Affleck associated with the with that movie via the same name. So if anybody wants to comment as to who's the worst, other than Matt Damon, of course, who's the worst actor that you just see the actor, you don't ever see the character, and who's the best? Who's the big name actors? Not some you know obscure person that was on the French screen of him just some major actor like who melds into their character where all you see is the character anybody wants to comment i'd be interested in seeing that um but don't you have to be fair you can't say arnold i mean nobody sees arnold's characters you see arnold arnold but that's his that's his charm i mean that's 
you know, he's so bad, he's good. That it's all about him and his quirks and his his speech impediments. And that you know, so that's not fair to say you don't ever see anybody but Arnold. Well, that's what, but that's what he brings. I mean, that's what his role is. You know, he's not trying to be a serious actor, although he did a hell of a good job in the Terminator. But basically, was just being himself. At least um, Maria Shriver would say so. But you know what I'm saying? Just be fair. You can't say Arnold. That, that's not fair because that's his it's his appeal. Okay, Groundhog Day, the movie with Bill Murray, was emailing back and forth with James. And I guess, I guess the last time I saw it, I was just watching for fun. I never really put the truth they live glasses on for Groundhog Day and, and, and scrutinized it the way I've scrutinized other movies for this channel or doing the breakdowns that I like to do. I've never done that with Groundhog Day. So I emailed back James. I said, James, what was the point that really broke him out of it. Is there something that you could point to that got him to end the, what is it, the Sansara cycle that broke Bill Murray out of it? Or is it just in general him evolving himself into a better human being or learning lessons? Is there one thing you could point to, which that's what escaped me again in watching Groundhog Day uh, for fun, and he said, yeah, there is there is one thing you could point to. Now, let me do one minute for anybody that is not overly familiar with the movie. Bill Murray is a reporter or weatherman in a, for a big station in Pittsburgh. He goes out with Andy McDowell, his producer, to cover Groundhog Day, the uh, Punxsutawney Phil in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, where they, you know, fake whether Phil saw his shadow or not for six more weeks of winter. So he finds he's waking up every day and it's Groundhog Day. Every day he looks outside and they're going to Gobbler's Knob and he's repeating the same day over and over again. And he's uh, at first, it, but, but you see the whole point of this is you see a, it's a personal evolution of Bill Murray, personal evolution during their repeating, his repeating reincarnations or samsara of Groundhog Day. So I'll get to what James said in a moment, but uh, just to continue uh, on the theme of what's being presented, at first he knows he's going to wake up tomorrow in the same situation, the same town, and then he's using it to his advantage. You know, to me, this is the way Tony would describe, you know, a, a sequential potential, a sequential uh, incarnation. He has described how real, the most real people that are here are you and me, a different type of incarnation, different from those that put their fat faces on the screen, different from Melvin P. Gates. He, the, uh, different. And, you know, when you look at Zuck the Borg, does that look like the same incarnation that you are? You, even, your, even the mind, we say, no, it ain't the same as me. One of these things is not like the other. Every, every ounce of... Uh, inside of every cell in your body says that thing ain't me. That's I don't know what that thing is. It ain't it ain't the same as me. So these are the he would say the calls them um, sequential incarnations, and that's what Bill Murray was acting like because he knew he had the knowledge, he carried forth the knowledge, and he used it to his advantage. Oh, doesn't that sound uh, similar to what these jerks do to us? Do to us those of us who truly are mind wiped uh, coming in to this existence. <clears throat> he knows where the Brinks delivery truck is going to be. So he waits and he steals from it. He learns about pretty women in town. He uses that to try to, and it seems like very successfully, get them into bed. <laughs> so he's using his knowledge. You know, again, this just, you know, this is the way Tony describes what these minions are. These these minions are not the same as you and me. He knows he can't pick up Nancy Taylor right there on the spot, so he's just going to collect information when he sees her in the diner, and he's going to use it the next day. He's like, do I know you? What's your name? Nancy Taylor. Where did you go to high school? Oh, who did you? Who was your fifth uh, period English teacher? Collects all the information and then knows he's going to repeat it. It's just, it does seem, very much seem the way these minion jerks do business. He's like, Nancy? Is that you, Nancy Taylor? It's me, Phil. I sat next to you. And she he knows so much about her. She's like, well, he, he must have sat next to me. I just forget. I get, how could he possibly know so much 
about me. It does scream as how these minion jerks do business. But then there's a personal evolution that starts to take place. It's not just about pleasure or what he can, how he can use his knowledge to game the system. And it relates back to you see him becoming a better person as it goes on. But what James said, he says, yeah, there is that, that one moment, even though you see signs of him no longer being a prick and trying to use everything to his advantage. And then after that, he goes through the depression cycle, just kills, trying to kill himself, not doing his job. Then he gets out of that and starts to actually better himself. And he said, yeah, it's that one point after he tells Andy McDowell they're in the diner, he says, I'm, I must be some sort of a god. Of course, she's never been through this before. He's been through it. From it, because he learns to play the piano so well, you would think that you one can assume he went through Groundhog Day about a thousand times, somewhere around there. I mean, he did this way more than you would think. And he's telling Andy McDowell, I'm, I'm a god. I know the, the life story of everybody in this diner. In 10 seconds, plates are going to crash. The plates crash. So she's very confused by all this, of course. And... He's, again, you see, he's no longer just trying to get her into bed. He's evolving as a person. He's trying to 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 actually f learn about, find out about her as a person, not just try to craft the day to get her into bed. And James said, yeah, remember there was that time when he, he started, you know, taking care of the old homeless man or giving the old homeless man money. And every day, the old homeless man at the end of Groundhog Day would die. And no matter what Bill Murray did... He could not keep, you know, he could not keep the old homeless man from dying. And that, you know, that means he's not a god. There are, you know, he can't control the things that are important. And then kind of right about that moment, he literally just in a very selfish, selfish, not, no, no, sorry, selfless way, simply tries to help others around him. And, and still improve himself, but actually it's beyond now improving himself. It's to actually assist. So he changes the flat tire. He saves somebody from choking. He catches a kid falling out of the tree, which is a pretty important point because the kid never thanks him. And he makes a joke, but he, he doesn't need to be thanked. He's evolved. He kind of makes a joke because, you know, it's a very short scene in a movie. It is a movie. And he's like, you're not going to thank me today either, are you? Well, I'll be back tomorrow, maybe. You know, I don't expect you to thank me then either for saving your life falling from this tree. And it seems like, it, you know, the, the message is he's making a little, a little bit of a, of, of a jab that he would like to be thanked, but he doesn't need to be thanked. He's evolved. He'll be back tomorrow to catch the kid again, knowing once again the kid won't thank him. So it, it, it's thankless. He doesn't need it anymore. He's doing it for himself. He's no longer trying to get Andy McDowell into bed. He's genuinely interested in her. Um, so this is the evolution of him personally that breaks him out of the, the reincarnation cycle. And the most important point is all of these friendly and nice things he's doing for everybody around the community, he is not doing it, at least the way they present it in the movie. It's a very important point. He's not doing it like, well, if I start helping people, maybe that will get me out of here. He doesn't assume he's ever going to get out at that point. Spending a thousand days every morning, you wake up, I got you, babe. I got you, babe, every morning. He's not saying, well, this is just another tactic to get me out, where I'm going to help everybody, and then selfishly, that's going to get me out. He doesn't think it is going to get him out. That's He's not doing it for those reasons. He's What he does and his actions throughout the day are done for completely different reasons than when the movie started, and this is the main point. See, in the beginning of the movie, it was like, what's going to get me out of this cycle? What's going to get me out of this cycle? What shortcut can I take? He even thinks it's related to the groundhog. He kidnaps Punxsutawney Phil, runs him off the side of a cliff. They both die in a fiery death. Just think, well, it must be this groundhog in some way must be associated. This must be some ritual or I'm going to take out the groundhog. It's all about me, 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 me. What what can I do? And it, only when it became nothing about me, me, me. He wasn't even thinking about getting out. Then he got out. So this does fly in the face of how many truth videos and, and breakdowns have we seen about how to beat, you know, the Saturn moon matrix 
or here comes the light. Oh, but don't go into the light. You got to know your tactics. You got to know what you're going to be up against going into your death. You or you know you need to know that you're going to be tricked. You need to do this. You need to do, see that. To me, that's 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 if we think there's truth in movies, that flies in the face of what Groundhog Day is presenting. And we'll talk some other time. Why do we believe wholeheartedly or know that there is truth in these movies? Some is pure truth. Some is probably meant to act like truth and to deceive. But we'll talk about that some other time. I and mean, we just we make have these conversations like there's truth in movies, and it's a given. There's truth that flows out of this media, and it is a given. But we should talk about why we believe that. So the Groundhog Day lesson is: oh, tactically, I've got to figure out when I die, there's going to be a light, and I need to know what to do. Groundhog Day would say it doesn't work that way. Only when you're ready, then you then you get out or you move on. When you're ready, selflessly then nothing can touch you. It's not about making the right moves or it's a, that, that old video game from the late eighties, the video game popped up called dragon's lair. Every video game looked like little blips, but this looked like a cartoon and you couldn't really control. It was a cartoon. So you couldn't control the guy. It was back in the late eighties. But if you did one little thing with a joystick, then you could get your little cartoon character. And it was like a full fledged cartoon. It looked like a Disney movie, but all you could do is move the joystick in one little spot to get it. And then the cartoon would continue. It's not like you could control him, but it's not, you know, it's not like that. If I just do this at the right time, I can get out of here. And the Dustin and Groundhog Day is no, only when you're not even thinking about helping yourself, do you help yourself or you break the, 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 uh, the uh, recycle process of samsara. If there's any bit of selfishness or if I steal the groundhog and kill the groundhog, it'll get me out of here. Or if I don't go into the light, all that tactical stuff, at least the theme in the movie Groundhog Day, is you're wasting your time. You have to come to a personal place. You can't beat this system. You think whoever designed this reality, you think they know something? Whoever did it, whoever you, your God or you were partially involved or your religion, it doesn't matter. Whoever laid this down certainly wasn't a big bang. Whoever laid this down, you think they know something? Probably. You think you can beat them with little little tactics like don't go into the light? You can just say, oh, yeah, that's all That's all you got to do. You, I got it. Yeah, just don't go into the light. You know how dumb down that must seem? Like they're like, yeah, we haven't thought of that one. Um, you just know if you have to, oh, look at this person over here. Oh, boy. They're putting themselves into a state they're, they're building themselves into a state where we can't – if there is – I'm saying from a dark forces perspective, let's just take it like that. It might not be dark, but from a dark forces perspective, be like, we can't touch this person here. What Bill Murray became at the end, he's – is he doing anything for himself at all? No. He doesn't – he's not doing anything for himself? Does he think helping people is going to get him out? No. We, we, this person has, has gotten into a state where frequency or we can't touch him. We can't touch him. He's – He's going to get out. You can't touch him. Or he's Bill Murray like, oh, tactically, don't go into the light. Do that. There's no way that that's the answer, guys. You just got to know what to do. No, I think the message in, in Groundhog Day, you know, and it gets back to why, W-O-I, why about yourself? Put yourself into such a state that you're not going to be visited by a angelic Dumbledore in all white telling you to go back to Hogsmeade. You know, just put yourself in a certain place and they can't touch you. That's the Groundhog Day message. And that resonates much more with me than we need to know exactly what to do to avoid the tricks of death. I, that just that doesn't resonate with me anymore. So we have to be a little careful with the recent slogan of WOI, Woy, about yourself, because that's a little, it sounds a little selfish when, you know, it has to be applied the Groundhog Day way. In my opinion, it has no selfish at all. If I do this, if I do this tactically, if I don't go into the light, if I have it all laid out, I'm out of here. That's selfish. I, I think that's a big factor. The Groundhog Day lesson of woi, W-O-I, about yourself. This theme carries through a lot of movies, um, if anybody wants to comment. But if I remember like the end of Jumanji, um, the one with Robin Williams, I believe um, – I don't know. Whoever was hunting him was 
somebody who knew or his father playing a character of the hunter. At the end, it's something about I forget Jumanji, but at the end, he's like he's just he just doesn't care anymore. Combined with he has no no really more importantly no more fear. It's like I, I'm not going to run from you anymore, the hunter. And he gets out basically very similar to the end of Revolver. This theme I'm sure is in a ton of movies. I have I'm just kind of doing this on the fly, where Ray Liotta at the end to uh, what's his name. Jason, whatever, um, Ray Liotta, I said the characters in Revolver are are probably, they're either parts of Jason St- Stamos' own mind, parts of his own mind, his own creation, or if they're real, it's like an egregore that he created. Somehow it's it all stems, all these characters stem from him. And Ray Liotta at the end is like, he's like shaking and he's like, fear me, I need you to fear me. And when I watched that recently, I'm like, that that that's not even a real character. That's just a figment of Jason whatever's mind. He's like, fear me. You must fear me. And then it just comes across Jason whatever. He just smiles at it. And he's like, you have no more power over me because it's, you know, if he realizes that it has no more power or he realizes it's just a part of himself, he's totally overcome it, in other words. And there is no selfishness there. It's overcoming it's kind of not caring. It's overcoming. It's similar to Groundhog Day. But it's like, Phil, this is what you need to do to get out. Oh, what do I need to do to get out? That's selfish. It's like, you know, I'm just going to – it's similar. It's it's hard to make the connection, but it is similar to Groundhog Day. Another similar one I just thought of is the third parole hearing in the um, Shawshank Redemption with Red or Morgan Freeman. And we talked about this. This is so important. It's worth revisiting. Talked about this about a year ago. The first two parole hearings, Red was telling, you know, he thinks he's telling him exactly what they want to hear, the parole board. Oh, no threat to society here. No threat to society at all. I've learned my lesson. Absolutely. Just just reading from a script, kind of telling them what they want to hear. The metaphysical point with that is he's playing by their rules. He's playing. He's not setting his own rules. He's playing by their rules. Just tell them what you think they want to hear. You could apply this to anything, trying to play by their rules. Where the third one, now Andy had already broken out, the third parole hearing, he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't give a shit, which in a way translates to he has power over over them because he just literally doesn't, doesn't care anymore. Now, does he want to get out? Probably, but he's just be, he's beyond it. He's not going to play their game. He's going to do it on his own terms. And he's like, go ahead, stamp your form, Sonny, and stop wasting my effing time. You know, but then he talks from the heart. He, he is, he is, has remorse. He says, yeah, the, the boy that did that, I don't recognize the boy that, that, that did that awful murder. I try to talk to him. I try to say, don't do it. But I got to live with this. You know, so stop wasting my time. Stamp your form. Get me the f out of here, and of course, then he gets he gets the parole. It's on his terms, All right? This this theme is very important as it as it runs through movies. And finally, um, this relates to what's going on right now. Um, I, I how many people do you know that are completely putting their life on hold, or you know, huddling away, or scared, or you know, I told my mother, my mother, um, we used to, we never did that much, but she's only seven or eight minutes away from here in Westchester. And we do um, Memorial Day, 4th of July, you know, a little outdoor picnic thing. We'll be over there, you know, four or five times a year, nothing major. But, you know, just, oh, can't have anybody over. But we're sitting outside on a deck 10 feet apart on a sunny blue sky. I mean, how, if it spread that easily, we'd all be kind of doomed, right? Sitting 10, can't even do that. Can't even sit 10 feet apart on a deck in a sunny blue sky. And I, every, a lot of people, most people that are older are just completely just waiting it out, putting their whole life on hold, those that have the least amount of days left. And, to me, this is a monst- a huge, huge, like, reality, metaphysical life test that these people are failing miserably, miserably. Um, in terms of if this is everybody's Groundhog Day or getting out or Samsara reincarnation is real or whatever your religion is or whatever you think you need to do for yourself here, if you are, if you are just fearful of what the news 
is bringing and fearful and hiding out and waiting for the for the action oh you have failed so miserably with you know the best case would be a, a re recycled reincarnated samsara type existence that there's just no way there's no possible way just think about your inner knowing your inner tuning fork is there anybody where if they have to, if it's whatever judge or self as judge or higher self as judge that says, oh, you just hey, you hid away and you put your you put your life on hold for years because of the what's going on now. Um, there's no way they they, they get a, a passing grade for this existence. I don't care what they did in the past. You know, it's it's Ray Liotta at the end just saying, fear me. And then the person saying, oh, I do fear you. Oh, oh, oh. And just Jason, instead of smiling at him, like, get the F out of my way. Or Morgan Freeman at the end, stamp your form, Sonny. Stop wasting my F in time. Oh, I'll do whatever you want. I've got to hide away. You're totally, they've lost. They've absolutely lost. Does that mean they should become reckless and they should go to uh, bubble parties? And just just mosh up and down with people in their seventies that they could be uh, have uh, you know uh, get this and uh, you know whatever whatever might be ma- making people ill. No, you don't have to run. You just don't have to be afraid of it. You don't have to run around and seek out the the bubble party locations of Central and South Florida. You don't have to be reckless or do something stupid. It's like well, if people looked at my habits. It looks like I'm hiding out. But what am I what am I going to do? Where am I supposed to go? What the hell am I supposed to do? No fr- family won't do anything. And friends think I'm nuts, you know. I'm, so I put my time in this. It's it's not like I'm hiding out. I mean, I don't know where to go anyway. But it's just it's But see, it see, it doesn't. It's not in the actions. It's in it's in the it's in the personal belief. It wasn't in the exact actions of what Phil did in Groundhog Day. Phil, Phil Connor, is that you, Phil? Ned Ryerson. It's not in the actions. It's it's in the personal development of the person. So, you know, does Matt have work to do in terms of fear, whether it be fear of C or fear of anything or fear of of a, of a big government or just is, do I? It's not in my actions. It's not like oh he he rolled up here and did this and he rolled down here and did that and he went to. It's it's like it's the, the reality knows. Whether you're gonna you're that third Morgan Freeman in the parole or the first Morgan Freeman, it it wasn't an oh Bill Murray did all these things to help people let's get him out of the no it was it was it was he he put himself there he put himself there he needed to put himself there through those actions. So by the way, this whole discussion does lead to it does support the consequence side of living life. It it really does. Almost every troop drop in movies, it does support that there's a consequence for for, and it's not just a consequence. See, we get too bogged down with the actions, consequence of actions, but sometimes actions is are needed to 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 create who we are to become ourselves using the tools here. So, just another another one on the side of consequence, if you ask me. Not the, not in the actual action. Oh, he helped the little old lady across the street? Give him a point. No. Those actions, it's a feedback loop that then creates a better you, a, a you that's then able to walk out of here. Phil was, is, it got himself to a point where he, they, the samsara couldn't recycle him again. Does this relate to the two utes? The two what? The two utes, the you that's going to fear what this society tells you to fear, the you that's going to be afraid, that's going to look to its standard and metrics to see if you've been a success or a failure, or the you that's going to be more like Morgan Freeman in the last parole meeting. Just like, I'm not, none of this affects me. I'm not going to run around and do the bubble parties, but I'm afraid of nothing. You know, so it's, this is the, the two, is that why, you know, there, there's two completely different sides of the brain. One side wants to merge and root here. One side is a chance of being Bill Murray at the end of Groundhog Day and just walking out of here. The two utes. The two utes. Which which ute are you going to choose? I like that the last parole hearing from Morgan Freeman. It, 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 boy, that that there's a lesson there. Big time. Now, this general concept, I think, absolutely relates to all of those people in our community 
who are looking at ways to evolve out of their legal fiction or evolve out of their straw man. And I don't know if you're listening to this, Thor, but it's time to finally have this conversation. There's two ways of doing it. And I'm not going to talk about tactics from Gemstone University. I don't, that to me is not important. It's not important. So you, first of all, anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about. There are these whole, it's a huge learning curve. You spend, Thor will tell you, months and months and months learning how to legally navigate out of your legal fiction, not be seen as the straw man, have the government do business with the real human being, not the fake creation and all that. It's all this legal mumbo jumbo. But it's, see, there's two reasons for doing it. One, if it's, see, if, it, if it's selfish, it's not going to work, in my opinion, related back to the Groundhog Day theme. Oh, I did all this. I, did, I sent an affidavit here. The government re, re, didn't reply, so that means it's an acceptance. I've, I've done all this to get out of away from my straw man and legal fiction, so uh, these are a whole slew of taxes I no longer have to pay. And all. If it's all about navigating to, to get – to just to get something more out of this life or, or – See, it's all that's the, that's a that's just a losing effort, in my opinion. If you're doing it to, and you need to do it, like the actions Bill Murray took in Groundhog Day, he needed to to catch the kid and like, well, that felt good catching that kid, saving that kid. I'm going to go try to help someone else or changing that tire. He, he in a way, was like that felt good, not what he could get out of it. Or I hope this gets me out of this re recycle trap. It just felt good, so he kept doing it. If you are navigating and you're spending 100 hours tr you know, trying for the government deal with you as a real human being, not a, a dead human being lost at sea, we've heard you know, all, that st all that maritime stuff. I don't understand it. I don't care to understand it because – see, I guess – let me just – to the, the final page of the book is if you are there mentally where you're like simply like I am not my legal fiction and you declare it and you believe it like read in the final parole hearing, then it has no power over you. You can, if you have the right frame of mind and intention as a real sovereign, spirited being, you can do away with those ties that bind in an instant, in my opinion, in an instant. So if if somebody might go through all that Gemstone University stuff to be able to like, I needed to do all that because it's just it's just helped me rise above it, and now I, I, I feel it. I feel it. it has no power over me. I am not my straw man. If you have to go through all that to get to a certain place, but see, I don't think you have to go through all that. I think it's, I think it's possible for the real sovereign spirit of human being to simply, with the right intention, declare it, and that's it. All those ties are gone. You are that powerful. And then another people like, oh, I want to do all this because I don't want to pay my parking tickets, and they won't. They, I, I won't. I don't deal through my straw man. So where are they going to send? It? See, this is all like selfish stuff. Like I'm going to do it because then I can avoid this tax or that tax. If you're doing it just to tactically get a one up on navigating this existence, you're like doing it to play. You're still playing in their rules. It, playing using their rule book. Oh, they have these set, set of rules that you that really apply to sovereign that you can take advantage of. And no longer be your legal fiction and straw man. You're still playing their game inside their legal system. You're still sending the affidavit to their courthouse, and that's fine. But that's not that's and that might again give you advantages in business or things that are important living this life. But it's not going to help you anyway spiritually. Or the only thing that most of us listening to this care about is being the Bill Murray, just getting to a certain state where you just walk out of this existence where they can't possibly recycle you or do anything to you or touch you or whatever. That's so. That's what most people here care about. So I'm just saying, don't think if you're gonna if you're gonna spend all that time navigating. You know, the, through the, the to get away from the straw man or whatever, don't you know that 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 might help you live the rest of your life in a much better way. But don't think don't think you need to do that spiritually to break ties to Bill Murray get out of here or to anything that that if, you have the power to do that now. You don't have to, and you're still in doing that. You're still you're sending your affidavits and letters to inside to their systems. You're appealing to their systems. You're, you're, it's like you're, it's like asking permission from the teacher to go to the bathroom. If you see what I'm saying, I'm saying if you do that, make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Somebody that completely comes to the realization of who they really are, to send a letter to any courthouse, declare it with the right intention, the ties are gone. I'm not my straw man. I'm not a legal fiction. 
They created this system. Well, Matt, you're going to continue to use the to you you know when you, in state liquor store they could or you if you go to buy alcohol at a grocery store you're going to get carded. You need to know, use your ID and then you're that to, so what they created this system. So what if I have to hand my ID over? Is that oh that ties me that that binds me to this world? They're, that's what they're going to use against me that I had. They create. I was born in the system. They created the situation. Okay, I need a driver's license to drive. I have to go get it renewed. You know, I mean, I, I don't. I think we're powerful enough to say, well, that, how does that bind me to this place? I continue to use legal fiction because I have to. I was born into this, and I'm not ready to go. You know, if they would, maybe if they, if I know knew they would leave me alone if I lived by, on my own somewhere. But see, they they screw themselves because they won't leave you alone. If you completely go off grid somewhere, they're not like oh, oh and send a letter to to the to the state house. They're gonna be oh, we're fine with that. Enjoy yourself. No, they'll come try to get you out of that situation. They won't leave you alone. That that they've screwed themselves. So they have no power over me if I continue to use my birth certificate or my passport and, and my driver's license that have the name in all caps of the legal fiction. If I continue to use that, I have to use that, and it holds no power or sway over me because they don't give me another option. If they gave me another option said, well, if you want to – you actually, here's a the whole state of South Dakota. Anybody can go there and build themselves a little log cabin, and if you do that, we'll give you 40 acres and a mule, and we'll be, leave you alone. That you'll have to – you'll have no services, no electricity, no – no, no public water, but we'll leave you alone. They don't leave you alone. That's why you, you, you're, you know, they don't, they've screwed themselves. Maybe that could have been a tactic used by Bill Murray. You could say, well, something must be holding me into this uh, endless cycle of Samsara and repeating Groundhog Day over and over again. Um, it's my legal fiction that must be holding me here. And maybe, well, let's start with the Punxsutawney courthouse. And I'll uh, go before the magistrate. And we'll start here. And then even though I can't leave... Um, you know, I'm kind of stuck here because the snowstorm. I've tried to leave Punxsutawney. I can't, even though I'm stuck here. I can use. They didn't have the internet, I guess, then, but I can use the mail system to to, to communicate directly with Harrisburg. And just like um, the truth drop in uh, in Andy Dufresne and the Shawshank, he created a fiction using nothing but mail. Remember, second cousin to Harvey the Rabbit, whoever the Harvey the Rabbit is. He's, he's like, Andy, you can't just make a person up. He's like, sure you can. If you know how the system works, maybe Bill Murray can then just do letters. Well, how would that work? Because he have to repeat the next day. He'd never get a letter back from Harrisburg. He'd never be able to get out of his le legal fiction. But you could see um, seeking remedy, Bill Murray seeking remedy through the magistrates and courts houses of Polk Satani as um, official – extensions of the capital at Harrisburg, that's not going to help Bill Murray get out of his life situation metaphysically. It wasn't the damn straw man of the name on his his credit card or his birth certificate or his driver's license that held him in that reincarnation cycle. It wasn't that. It was It was evolving, walking into a new state of being, which we all have the capability to do. You don't have to seek permission to do it from those that position themselves as your masters. And such a huge theme from Groundhog Day is state of being, not amount of deed or amount of actions. State of being. That being said, if Phil could have gotten the way, this is the way I see it or what I believe. If Phil, Phil, Phil caught, if Phil could have gotten himself into a certain state just by one act of kindness, then that's what he needed for himself to walk out of there, in my opinion. He needed to do all that stuff for himself. Somebody's going to come along like some judge is going to sweep in and say, no, 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 Matt, there's no way he could have got out of that reincarnation cycle after just one event because, see, this rule book here says he has to have at least 300 acts of kindness repeating the same day over and over so you can get to 300. He needs to eclipse this, eclipse this metric. No, those number of things are just necessary to get himself into a certain state of being. That's that's the point. What a coincidence. The reality here through the minions, through society, through governments, the reality operates in the reverse fashion. Remember, if anybody's ever struggling with what to do, observe what society wants you to do. Then you know to do the opposite. It works almost every time. Don't forget that. You can apply it here. So what's the ultimately 
devolving a human downward into something that has lost all sense of its spiritual self, the first, one of the first steps of that is legal fiction. First name caps, last name caps on the birth certificate, on your credit cards. But ultimately, where's that going? Is it just, just fine with that? No, it always has another sick place to try to take you or an agenda around the corner. What Steffers wrote about in Peace of Mindful uh, a few weeks back, Digital Twin, they're not satisfied with you identifying with first name caps, last name caps, straw man, lost out at sea, you know, all that stuff. They want to keep taking it, keep pushing it. They'll never stop the next step. You'd be like, well, how many steps could there be after digital twin? Digital twin, where the stuff that we uh, just guessed was going on is now coming out that it's it's pretty much happening. We guessed, and, and you know, I floated this, others floated this years ago, that, you know, years ago, that there is some supercomputer running societal simulations. And there isn't somebody in the supercomputer running a societal simulation as to how people react if we, the assholes, do this. How will California react if... Sacramento and the legislature one day pops up and says, anybody uh, age 14 and over can get all the birth control they need, including the morning after pill without parental consent. How will society react to that? Whopper computer spits out. Blah, 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 blah. Well, they won't much like it if they're surveyed, but they won't do anything about it. And they'll just accept it and become habituated to it as usual. Oh, okay, so do it. Do it. People think that, that nobody wanted that stuff, all that sick stuff that these legislatures puts in place. Nobody wanted it. It's imposed on society, and then they'll make you believe that, well, there just was some little grassroots organization that wanted it, and nobody pushed back. Nobody wanted it. It wasn't pushed for by anybody. It just came out of the legislator. Nobody would want anybody, a kid age 14, to get unlimited birth control, including the morning after pill without parental consent. Nobody wanted that, but yet we have it. So inside the supercomputer that's predicting what society will do, what different masses of populations will do, it's not something that like, looks like you. It's you. We, they, my staffers would probably agree now. Digital twin. It has your same social security number. It knows based on your likes and your tweets and your emails and all the surveillance it's done on you. It knows how you react to everything. So the point is, sure, you start with having an individual – identify with the straw man and the legal fiction, but then ultimately the individual will be bred or meant to identify with the more digital or more virtual aspect of itself, the legal twin. And it's just, again, all as that pushes forward, it's a loss of spiritual connection. Of course, it's all it's about. But you don't have to, like, navigate that and send affidavits to government uh, back and forth, hoping not to get a reply because that uh, implies acceptance. And you just – you can just say, I, this is not me. I choose to strengthen my spiritual connections. And if it's revealed to me and somebody points out the actual supercomputer where Matt, the actual me that used to have brown hair, is now slightly thinning and who used to be – 5'11", but then you get older, you shrink. That, that digital twin in there, that's actually you. Somebody could point that out. Oh, no, what am I going to do? I've got to appeal to government that they shouldn't be representing me. I think we, we're powerful enough if you have the right spiritual connections and have that sense of self that Phil Connors became to just say, well, I don't care what they're running in that supercomputer. I don't care if there's a digital twin in me and there's supercomputer. I dress the app, dress my digital twin up like the Sims game. Put it in a in a yellow zoot suit. I don't care what you do in your little simulation game. I don't care if you send me little documents that say legal fiction. I don't have to navigate through your systems to try to get away. I, I'm responsible for getting for getting uh, for for not putting any power into that. They they want you to oh you've got to you've got to then appeal that. No, you don't. Just would just be be red. I don't stop wasting my freaking time. Do what you want with my digital twin. It has nothing to do with me. Next time you see your driver's license at the bottom of your purse, buried under stuff, just pull it out and be like, "Yep, there it is." First name caps, last name caps. What do you think metaphysically needs to be done? That you need to then just be like, "I need to send some letter into government to make sure that they know that's not me," or just say it, just hold it in your hand and say, "I see what they're trying to do here." I see what you're trying to do. Just don't hold no power over me. Create all the digital twins you want. Stop wasting my time. 
Yeah, I need to renew this stupid thing because you say I need to to drive a car. I'm like, just no, I don't give you no power. I'm not giving a part of myself up because I've got to use this thing. It's I, I'm not just saying this, folks, to make myself feel better or to make you feel better. Think of it inside every cell in your body. What is it telling you? That if you don't um, find a way to navigate out of it, it's going to hold sway over you at your death or you just completely have the power to – to not give it any power because that's what you freaking declare. That's your intention. It's so clear to me. It's so clear to me. It's not because I'm lazy and I don't want to send letters back and forth to Harrisburg to navigate out of the legal fiction of my birth certificate. I'm, I, it's, it's up to me whether I give it any power. I don't give it any power. I'm going to get my driver's license renewed. I'm not going to try to change my name to Nuwanda or anything like that. Whatever. It doesn't hold any power. There, done. Don't, I'm not sending a letter. I don't have to do anything else. I'm done. I'm good for the rest of my life. I absolutely believe that. If you, if you don't believe you're, if you believe you're a powerless little worm that needs to appeal to every, all your masters, then run around this, and try to navigate their systems. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to do that. Okay, I can hear people yelling right now. Absolutely could hear people yelling. Well, Matt, how does this apply to the Carl Weathers who should have received several Academy Award, at least nominations, the Carl Weathers Action Jacksonation. How does that apply? It's a good, I, it's a, I heard people screaming at me, so that's what they were screaming at me. I don't know. I don't know how I'll answer this. Um, someone could say, isn't that just an extension, Matt? If you're so powerful, you can just declare your straw man as having no sway over you. Um, then you didn't, you know, go live your life, go get the action. The Carl Weathers should have received several Academy Award nominations. Carl Weathers Action Jacksonation. Go get it and live your life and just declare as this all powerful being that you claim to be that it has no sway over you. Okay, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't that don't sit right with me. For, I'm gonna have to pause this and think about it for a second. First off, I want to be fair to those that I was representing in that mock debate. Uh, if do you need to live your life in a certain way because of certain consequences, those that believe in no consequence, again, they would like to weigh in here and I'll weigh in on their behalf as Vinny representing uh, Ralph Macchio and trying to convict Ralph Macchio at the same time. They would weigh in and say, Matt, Matt make sure you tell these people our belief would be, and if I could speak for them, I will. They would say, look, it's a realization that you are of the divine. This is what they would say. I think there is a consequence to this existence. They would say there's no consequence to this existence. Once you realize you are of the divine, you are of the same stuff of God. You are basically a part of God, an aspect of God. By very definition, God can't create something that's not of itself. Therefore, these minions or whatever they're here to do, they can't put something in your arm that would take away your connection to the divine. They, they can't get a, by putting something physical in your arm, they would say they 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 planned. Uh, several of these people that I've talked to plan to get the action. They said, "There's if I'm, they have a realization they are of the divine. If that's if you really realize that, well, are they going to put something in your arm, some nanobots, some seven and nine nanobot that's going to suck your soul or take your soul away, like the Stormbringer sword in the Michael Mark Moorcock Elric series? They're not worried about it. They said they can't." Put something in my arm. It can't touch the true nature of who I am, of the divine. There's something to be said about that. I'm not ready to go down to the local uh, testing center, uh, but, but there, I have. I have. But I'm just telling you what they would say. Okay, I'm not sure exactly what. I'm not going to get no Carl Weathers action jacksonation or anything. But I'm not sure exactly what I would say. So I got to pause and come back in a second. It's pretty simple. I was only uh, I was only passed out for a minute there. It's just it's simple consequence. It just comes back and hits me again. I see it. I see. I see consequence. It's the Merovingians' causality in um, the Matrix. Cause and effect. That's. I'll stop that. That's the Merovingians' causality. So you have an entire reality that wants you to believe you are not your true self. It plays a billion tricks. And it puts out a billion deceptions to get you to believe you are this when you're really that. Okay, that's all it does is to get you convinced you're your all caps first name, all caps last name, straw man. That's you. It wants you to believe that you're something else. Of course, farthest thing or furthest thing from 
what's called a spiritual bridge or the divine. Okay, it plays those games. So, of course, the Carl Weathers, who should have been up for several Academy Awards, the action Jacksonation would be just another way to get somebody to uh, contract with this system. They must get something if you contract with it enough or too much or tie yourself. There's something, there's just, why do they, we get back to the same things. Why do they play all these tricks? Oh, you're just, you're of the divine. They can't touch you. Well, they don't know that. They're just going to keep playing all these tricks at you for your entire life, getting you to root your belief system and what they pull forth. But there's just, they can't do anything. They, they, they should know by now that there's no reason to do that. Why do, why do they play all the tricks? You're of the divine. You're of God. They can't, they can't get anything out of you. They can't have you doom yourself or have you make too many contracts or make you have yourself just um, believing that everything you are is over here, which is, uh, which is really cutting off your own spiritual bridge. So you know that the no consequence people, but all these minions and all these people that hold the ancient knowledge, they have no clue. They have no clue. So they're just wasting their time. And for anybody that's real, they're just wasting their time because they get, oh, they get these real people over here to make contract and to merge with it and then to actually believe they are their digital twin, but they can't touch you. So uh, they just wasted their time. See, I'm not sure. I, I have a hard time believing through all the tricks. They didn't put out like five tricks. Over, they put out like 500 trillion tricks to get me to do the wrong thing or think, uh, uh, or think wrongly about myself. Five trillion stinky tricks. I think there's a reason for that, right? And th it all does relate back to consequence. What, is, what are all these tricks for? If there's no consequence, I don't get that. Nobody, even the smartest people, have not been able to explain that to me. Uh, they play a trick on me. This whole society, would, they, would anybody disagree with that? Yes, Matt, I agree. The entire society, which you call the not nilk the screen, through its minions, through its different genres and classifications of minions, whether it be stars of stage and screen, news anchors, academia, what scientists believe, the entire minion class, most of which believe in it themselves and aren't in on it, they don't know it in the back room, it's all BS, they are here to convince you to believe in it. To, they're here to trick you at all levels. Would anybody listening to this ever disagree with that? No, they'd say, of course they're here to trick you at all levels. Well, what's it for then? What's the trick for then? There's no consequence. There's no consequence. They're playing these – I'm going round and round. Playing these tricks on us for thousands of years and not one of these poor bastards – could one of these minions even recognize it was, it was, it was it's pointless because you can't you – can't, you can't ever uh, doom the divine. See, the, to me, it doesn't fly. Sorry. And even if we're not sure, am I going to just take a chance and say, oh, if I get the action Jacksonation, I can go back to the Metallica concert with a Lincoln Park opening up without Chester. I can go back there. Well, isn't that great? But what are, what's the reward? A stupid-ass Metallica concert with Lars jumping around his drum set? Well, that sucks anyway. What, what, is it, what do I get out of that? What do I get out of that? I can see the NFL again on live or – a NASCAR race or like what's the the risk reward doesn't make any sense. So if I don't know, I'm going to err on the side that there is consequence. Why not err on that side? I'd rather err on that side and make sure I'm making the right, you know, choices. And somebody said, "Well, Matt, you're you're contradicting yourself." If which which I which I am, I just caught it. If you are B Bill Murray and becoming human being, human becoming, becoming into a certain state then it doesn't matter what your choices are. I agree with that to a degree. But the member Bill Murray didn't get to that state just by waking up in the morning and throwing his alarm clock on the ground. He had to go through it. it it's a feedback loop. It's the choices then feed back on the human becoming. If you are so great and grand you can become the human becoming without having to do a damn thing, then that's wonderful. That's rare. Most people have to put the, the sweat equity and the time, have to go through the bog. So it's like if you don't get the action jacksonation and that that makes you just one little step closer to the to the ultimate level of the human becoming and Phil getting out of Groundhog Day, then it's helpful even though technically you might not have needed to do that. But how many people are going to be completely maybe maybe these rare people that that believe they are of the divine or 100% convinced of it would pass the lie detector test, they've already got themselves into a certain state and they they potentially can get the action jacksonation but i don't think that's going to be the case for most of us 
most of us, it's a loop. Our, our deeds and efforts will then reflect back and strengthen who we are, or who we want to become. We will very, we, we, most of us will be fooling ourselves thinking we have become that certain person without doing a damn thing to get there. If you see what I'm saying, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? I think the consequence, no consequence thing is being solved to a degree because it's not one or the other. It's the fact that most people will need to live their life a certain way, basically believing that there be consequence to go to the next level, to better themselves, to start doing the right things in life as Bill Murray did, not looking for a reward for doing it, not doing it because of fear of consequence. It will, it's all part, I think, of, of the, uh, the evolutionary steps. And perhaps all the tricks that the minions and the screen plays on behalf of the not milk reality is to get you. They simply are, want to position themselves. You never get to that level. You know, you're tricked um, into never getting to that level. So in a way, this does support, in a way, this supports the non-consequence people if they're completely in that final state that Bill Murray got themselves in. And I'll say it again, most people will not be able to get themselves into that state, into a, not into a complete knowing that they're untouchable, into a complete knowing that they are, without doing the work of the divine and, and everything, if God put a trillion aspects of itself in this reality, that they're just ready to walk out of here, it's a long way to go to get there if you, if you don't do the work yourself, Okay. I think most people will have to do the work themselves. So it's kind of a the, the, the consequence, no consequence thing is actually kind of melding in the middle. Um, and I didn't, it seemed like it was a, it was a less filling taste great debate, uh, completely one or the other. And now uh, they're much more connected than they seemed, which makes sense with the beer example, less filling tastes great. In the end, it was, it was all the same beer. Now, wasn't it? Thanks for listening.